So Kate tries getting another flight. Since she's already been from Paris to Dallas, and now she's in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Fortunately for Kate, Hope shows up in the form of John Candy and a bunch of polka bums. So after somewhat introducing her to the band, well, he introduces himself as, I think, Gus Malinsky or something like that. Yep, basically the polka king of the Midwest. The Kenosha Kickers. Well, anyway, they sold a lot of copies of one record in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Very popular in Sheboygan. As fate would have it, their flight was canceled, so they rented a van to drive to Milwaukee. Since Chicago is on the way to Milwaukee, they'll happily give her a ride. Yes, ride with a bunch of polka bum strangers. I'm sure nothing can go wrong there. So Kevin sets up and decorates his own Christmas tree. I find it hard to believe the McAllisters didn't do that already. And that's when Harry looks through the window. Kevin sees his reflection in the Christmas ornament. So, that's when Harry puts two and two together. Kevin is home alone. Yep, so they devise a plan. The plan is that they will unload the van, get a bite to eat, and then come back around about nine o'clock. That way it's dark, and, well, kids are scared of the dark. And then again, at his age... Marv still is, too. Anyway, Kevin asks the world's sexiest elf if Santa is still here, but, well, he's just getting in his car now, and he's late for a little get-together. But, of course, he got a ticket on Christmas Eve. How low can you get? What's next? Rabies shots for the Easter Bunny? So Kevin delivers a very important message to this Santa Claus. All he wants for Christmas is just his family. Peter, Kate, Buzz, Linny, Megan, his aunt and his cousins. And if it's at all possible, if there's time, maybe even Uncle Frank. On the way back home, though, Kevin spots, well, a family at Christmas time. And, well, obviously he wants the same thing, of course. And that's when he notices old man Marley. Rumored to be the meanest, rottenest guy in the neighborhood, the South Bend Shovel Slayer. But as it turns out, he's actually a real pussycat, nicest guy in the neighborhood. Yes, there are a lot of rumors going on around about him that he's aware of, but none of it's true, he assures Kevin. And so now it's time for Kevin to have a nice heartwarming chat with Ben Kenobi. I mean, old man Marley. And he shows Kevin... His granddaughter, the little red-haired girl. I must say I like this guy better than the crazy pigeon lady from the sequel. It's a great moment, obviously, where Kevin gets to meet and learn more about old man Marley. Yep, says these two have a heart-to-heart -heart about their families, the difficulties they both have with them. You know, in Kevin's case, his older brother. In the old man's case his own son. The fact that Kevin has to booby trap his house in order to prepare for the arrival of the wet bandits. Now, as mentioned before, I was asked, why, does the, why do the McAllisters have a pet door if they don't seem to have a dog? Well, as I said before, it's very subtle, but there is a reference to the dog being in the kennel. And, of course, everybody remembers this scene with the iron falling on Marv's face. Yep. I can't see why Warner Brothers would reject this film. Ah, uh, yes, we go from sticky stairs to stingy stairs. So Harry tests out this door. It's not hot. So he figures that he can just easily go in, right? Wrong. There's a blowtorch there and burning his head. And I imagine this is probably how Macaulay Culkin would greet Michael Jackson if he came to his house. But we won't get burned again, so... He just bursts the door down and shouts, Where are you, little creep? Anyway, Kevin purposely left the window open, knowing that one of them would probably go through it. But before we get hijinks like that, well, we've got to have this fan blowing a bunch of feathers onto Harry. Tar and feather him. 
Too good for him, I say. Yes, it's Micro Machines, the machines that actually can trip up burglars and also save little children's lives. Yes, sir, my friends, they are the Micro Machines, and I can't talk as fast as John Machida. But after getting smacked with some paint cans, well, this is where Marv notices that Harry's missing some teeth. And yep, I'm afraid that does include his gold tooth. So it's time to try to put on an adult voice and say my house is being robbed. My address is 656 something something Lincoln Boulevard. My name is Murphy. So Marv has almost got Kevin. Almost got him. But then that's when he notices Buzz's tarantula. As mentioned before, that tarantula was not mechanical. It was real. There was a problem with the mechanical one breaking down, so they had to make sure they were using a real one. And they also had to make sure the stinger wasn't intact. Is it any wonder Daniel Stern almost didn't bother with the part? So he tries whacking the tarantula off of, off of Harry, but ooh, keep in mind that's how Jason Todd was killed in the Batman comics. So Kevin puts a lot of faith in his little uh, wire thing here that slides him right into this treehouse. So, Harry and Marv try following Kevin with that cable to the treehouse, but given that they're the bad guys of the film, this ends, well, rather predictably for them. Now that I'm done with them, I'm gonna try and kill Elijah Wood. <laughs> Harry knows that this is exactly what Kevin wants them to do. He wants them to follow him. So he's got a better idea. They're gonna go in through the front while Kevin goes in through the basement and... Yeah, you see why they're called the Wet Bandits. I tell ya, that house is just an inch away from burning down. But that's when he's saved by the South Bend Shovel Slayer. Yes, old man Marley. Yes, as he saves Kevin and gets him home and they call the police. So old man Marley saves Kevin. The police take the Wet Bandits into custody and all seems right with the world. As Kevin even leaves milk and cookies out for Santa... I must admit I do find this scene a little puzzling. Uh, when did Kevin find the time to clean up all the booby traps and everything? I mean, you'd think he might have accidentally forgotten one, and maybe Aunt Leslie stepped on a micro-machine and broke her neck. And so the polka bums drop Kate off at the house, and, well, that's when Kevin notices she's here! So they have their lovey-dovey family moment as mother and son embrace, but she's genuinely surprised when everybody else shows up at the door. Apparently they took that morning flight on Friday, the one that Kate didn't want to wait for. So everyone's all, Kevin, my boy, Kevin, oh, how are ya? And you remember this line from Buzz? I thought that would be an important point to remember. So yes, we're all happy to see Kevin. Hooray, hooray. And they just leave him alone again. Whatever. But that's when Peter notices Harry's gold tooth. Apparently, well, you remember that line that uh, Marv had where he said, you're missing some teeth? I'd hang on to that, Peter. That could be worth something. And so Kevin notices outside his window that old man Marley has fully embraced his family, including his red-headed granddaughter, and all is right with the world. Except for one tiny little detail. Kevin! What did you do to my room? Oh, that! And that's that. Now there's the first Home Alone. Of course, for John Hughes, Home Alone would really be the turning point when he stopped doing, well, teen angst films and then went on to do more kid-friendly flubber, I mean fluff, up until his death in 2009. So I hope this look is shown. The premise was rather simple, but the ideas and story base behind it were often sublime.